morning, church. How is everyone this morning? So good to see you. But I want you guys to stand to your feet. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. Let me pray for us as we get started. God, we are just so thankful just to be in your presence, just to be here. I pray that you uh, go before us this morning. And uh, God, we're not here to give you something that you need that's going to complete you. God, we're here just for you, for who you are. And I pray this morning that that's how our hearts are proclaiming. That's what we're feeling. And that we're just walking with you. So in your name that I pray. Amen. Here we go.
so I can face tomorrow. For tomorrow's in your hands. All I need, you will provide, just like you always have. I'm fighting a battle. You've already won. No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. Don't know what you're doing, but I know. mercy in the waiting man of for today and when it's gone I know you're not you are my hope and stay when the sea is raging your spirit is my help he'll fix my on Jesus Christ, I'll say that it is well. Oh, I know that it is well. I'm fighting a battle. You've already won. No matter what comes my way.
and burn out in the flame till nothing between us remains my life is an altar to you breathe again on the embers that burn in my heart I love taking back to the start my life is an altar to you
an altar to you. My life is an altar to you. God, we come to you this morning. As we are singing words like, God, I just pray that you just breathe on us, oh God. Breathe in our hearts to light the embers. God, that our passion is here for you we sing songs like God we are here for you and I pray that that's what our heart's desire is this morning that's nothing about ourselves certainly nothing you need but just to say God I am here for you my life is an altar for you this morning Sunday mornings that you have driven here so that when everyone walks in and sees you, they feel like it is family here at Parkside. And a special thanks to those Parkside Kid volunteers for all those Sunday opportunities that you have sacrificed and the countless hours that you have spent preparing your hearts and all those lessons to ensure that those kids feel and experience the love of Jesus through you on a Sunday morning. Thank you for all the coffee you've made, all the lessons you've taught, for keeping us safe here at Parkside for all the doors you've held open. For all the games that you've played with smiles on your faces so that our community might know that Jesus loves them too. Thank you for holding grace in an open hand, always ready to go the extra mile to help people meet Jesus. Thank you for loving God, loving others, and leading them to Christ. Colossians 1.3 expresses mine and the whole staff's prayer for each of you, our volunteers, when it says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And as Ruth 1.8 says, may the Lord reward you for your kindness. Thank you. Thank you for always leading with a servant's heart. Thank you for making Parkside a loving, a caring, a welcoming family. It is an honor and a joy and a blessing to serve the Lord together. Thank you. You make serving fun. You make this a blast. Thank you for making Parkside Christian Church a place where people can experience the life-changing presence of God. Well, once again, just good morning to everyone. If you, um, if you were a volunteer and you were made it here a couple weeks ago, we celebrated our volunteers. And again, we, again just, we just wanted to let you guys know just how thankful we are. And uh, if you guys would just give everybody a clap who's a volunteer right now. They, they sacrifice, they serve, they do so much. And we just wanted to say thank you so much. Hey, just a couple of things coming up we want to let you know about. The first thing is uh, a, a guy's no excuse night coming up tomorrow night. Now, Matt has wrote this up, and he said uh, that there's no excuses for you not to be there. It's from 10 to 11 o'clock at night. Uh, the theme of this one is talking about fishing, but I think there's more to it than just fishing. I think it's just a chance for guys to get together. Um, Matt's not here, so I'm going to give you guys all his cell phone number. If we'll just all text him right now, that would, we won't do that. Also, coming up is the Father-Son Campout, which is August 4th through 6th at the Versailles State Park. Uh, I think the deadline for that is today. Every guy, every dad um, who has gone to this, they have nothing but amazing things to say. The pictures usually flow into me, so I get to see these pictures. It looks amazing. It's a great time of just being together, great bonding time, and there's tons of things to do. If you want more information on either of those things, check the bulletin. But for the camp out, you can go outside or into the lobby area and get more information on that. Tracy, one of our mission partners from Life Forward, is here this morning. If you guys will welcome her to the stage. Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you here today. And my name is Tracy, and I am with Life Forward. We are a pregnancy medical clinic here in the Cincinnati area. And I just want to say thank you uh, to Parkside. You have been a partner with Life Forward for over a decade. So thank you so much for supporting Life Forward and what we get to do. You are a part of helping women 
and families make life-affirming decisions through God's love. So we have three locations. Our main office is in Clifton, and we also have um, offices in Springdale and in Loveland. And what we get to do when we serve women and we serve families, we're able to offer them a variety of medical services, even care services, at no charge because of partners and people like you who give to the ministry, who volunteer, who donate items. Um, we see just a variety of clients. We have women who come in in um, just all sorts of circumstances, and we're able to offer um, a loving caring environment. They get to sit down with one of our nurses and we just talk with them and see where they are in life. We can offer them a pregnancy test, um, an ultrasound. We also have parenting classes uh, for women uh, and their families. Uh, We have a car seat and a stroller program. One of the things that I love about Life Forward is we actually have hospitals in our area that will, and doctors who recommend women come to us if they need a car seat. We're one of the only places where women can get a car seat for free, and we're able to offer that because of partners like you. Um, I talked with our client services director this week, and I just asked her about um, a client that she got to experience uh, this week and wanted to share that with you. So we had a client who came and visit us this week to pick up care closet items, and she actually uh, first visited us last year when she thought she was pregnant, and she was. We were able to confirm that and do an ultrasound and just kind of give her the support and the care that she needed. So she also uh, decided to participate in our parenting class, which we call Upward, and she was able to just connect there with other moms. She still is connected a year later with some of the other moms that she had in that class. And one of the things that we see with women who uh, we get to serve is that many of them are just in uh, really unique circumstances. Um, I'm really new to the Life Word family. I just started in January. And one of the scriptures that the Lord highlighted to me uh, when I came to the ministry was Proverbs 31.8. It says, to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, ensure justice for those being crushed. And the Lord just moved in my heart that we would get to do that at Life Forward. And Life Forward has been doing that for almost 40 years. We get to speak up for those who are being crushed and ensure justice for those who aren't seen. Sometimes that is the unborn, and sometimes it's the mom who often has been in um, a victim of, of some kind of lifestyle that's very difficult to come out of. And we get to be we get to show her the love of Jesus by providing community, by providing support. Many of the women who come to us, when they're pregnant, they are not sure how to be a mom. They don't know if they can do it. And they just need somebody to come alongside them that says, we see you. We know this is hard. I don't know how many of you are parents out there. I have two little boys. Parenting is not for the faint of heart, friends. When my babies were babies, they were hard. I needed somebody to see me and love me, and we get to be that community of support for these women. And so this client who came to us over a year ago, she actually came back this year. She's a single mom. The father's not very involved, and she was able to pick up some care closet items for her child, and she accepted prayer with one of our client services team members. And so we get to see clients like this week after week because of how you partner alongside us. And we have an event coming up called Strides for Hope. It is our annual 5K walk and run. And Miss Bridget is already organizing a team. So Parkside actually has a team. So if you would like to participate in the walk or run, if you want to come out, it's a morning of lots of fun. We do walk, we run, we give you Chick-fil-A afterward. So you know it's going to be a good day. Um, If you're not interested in walking or running, you can also sponsor the people who are walking and running. And if you have any questions, we're going to have a table in the back. My colleague Sarah is here with me. Uh, and Bridget also have more has more information. So we'd love for you to get involved. You can support the ministry through Strides. And church, just thank you once again for all you've done to support life here in the community. Yes. Am I on? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. And we want to say a prayer for Tracy and for the ministry there. So let's join me, please. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you're just always at work around us and the way that you reach into our hearts and touch them in a way that we can just respond to people with your love and your care. 
Thank you for Life Forward, for Tracy and the team. And I just pray that you'll blessing on them as they serve and as they love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's put that right over there. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Randy Shivers. If you're new with us, we are so glad that you decided to come and be with us today. And uh, Matt is on vacation, so <clears throat> here I am. You're stuck. No, but I'm just really glad to be the one to speak today and, and thankful for that opportunity. And, uh, but we do want to, if you are new, we want to say thank you for coming. And there is at the information desk, we have some more information and a gift for you. If you'd like to, we'd like to meet you and would like to find out a little bit more about our Parkside family. If you're not new and you've been here before, <clears throat> you've seen me around here for a while. And uh, before I go any further, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you for the encouragement and the prayer and the support that Cindy and I uh, received when we took off for our sabbatical the month of June. We had a wonderful adventure. We were in like 13 states. We crossed three time zones and we drove 7,000 miles. And we witnessed the hand, the firsthand, the diversity of the scenery uh, of the northern part of our country, all the way as we went out to Glacier. And it's a vast and a beautiful nation. We enjoyed beautiful lakes and waterfalls and mountains. We uh, saw a variety of wildlife, including a grizzly bear from a distance. But it was pretty cool. <clears throat> so we're just so very thankful that we got to spend that time together and just relax and enjoying each other. And, and then we also enjoyed spending time with friends and family along the way and on the way back. It was just a wonderful opportunity, and I want to say thank you. Thank you for making that happen. And we are just so blessed and honored to serve the Lord with this church family. We are very thankful, but we are glad to be back. It's good to be back and looking forward to what's ahead. There is no place like home. I also want to thank everyone who wrote a little note or a card. I actually couldn't believe how many were piled up on my desk when I got back. Um, I took two days. I took two days to read them all so I could just take my time and appreciate each one of you that wrote one. Thank you. So having said all that, I want to move on because today we are going to continue our journey through the book of Mark. So if you've got your Bible or you've got your phone app or whatever, a Bible app to get that out, we're going to be in chapter 11 today. And when Matt asked me to speak today, when it worked out for the schedule, um, I didn't, it it just happened to work out that Mark 11 is a passage that I've actually spoke on before here on Sunday morning. So you may hear some familiar thoughts. Um, I, did, I did look at it again, studied it again, but I just came up with some of the same conclusions. So I feel kind of like Paul when he wrote Philippians 3.1. He said, it is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. It is a safeguard for you. So I'm kind of taking that same approach. It's no trouble for me to say some of the things that I've already said before. And uh, I hope that it'll be helpful. I hope that you'll benefit from hearing these words from God's word. And actually, if you want to come up to you afterwards and say, I remember all that, that's good. That means you were listening. But I guess my question is, do, have you done it? You know, so that's, we want to, we want to put that out there. So chapter 11 Mark chapter 11 is the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life here on this earth. And today we're going to look at a colt, we're going to look at a courtyard, and we're going to look at a curse as we look into how Jesus focused in on God's plan as the, the events of that last week unfolded. Before we go on into chapter 11, though, I want to back up to chapter 10 and catch a passage that we didn't get to last week. But it's chapter 10, verses 32 and 34. Because uh, I think this is important to set up this last week of Jesus' life. So here we go, Matthew 10, 32 through 34. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. 
Three days later, he will rise. This was now the third time that Jesus had mentioned that he was going to go to Jerusalem to be killed. He mentions it in Mark 8.31 and in 9.31. And his disciples were probably wondering by this point, you know, if that is what's going to happen in Jerusalem, Jesus, maybe we should just go the other way. Maybe we shouldn't go to Jerusalem. But no, for Jesus, that Jerusalem was the place where we would fulfill his Father's will. His whole purpose for coming to this earth was to be in Jerusalem during this Passover season, and nothing was going to divert him from going to Jerusalem. And he was, as it said, leading the way. Anyone who thinks that Jesus was just this carefree, mild manner type of a person, I think you need to reconsider. There's two things I want us to think about Jesus as we look at this and we consider this trip to Jerusalem. First of all, I want you to think about Jesus' courage. There are two types of courage. There's the courage that is the result of instinctive reaction. Usually it's a response to a crisis without much time to consider the consequences. We have first responders and people who jump in to save the day or save someone's life, uh, our military, so many people that will jump in and do that. That takes a lot of courage just to respond and step into crisis. But there's another kind of courage, and that's the courage that results from looking ahead to grim or painful outcomes knowing you must step into the reality of that situation. That takes a lot of courage. And I know there's a lot of people in this room who I would consider very courageous for the way you face each day. But Jesus had a tremendous amount of courage. Yes, Jesus was God in a human body, which meant he was not exempt from physical pain. He understood emotional drama and mental anguish. He knew the feelings of rejection, and he did feel the pain. I imagine he even saw firsthand the Romans crucify someone before. As he entered Jerusalem, that was uh, probably on his mind. He was very well aware of the difficult and painful journey that faced ahead, and he that was ahead and he faced it with courage. The second thing, Jesus' courage is also Jesus' commitment. Don't ever think, don't ever think that Jesus accidentally ended up on that cross because he made some people mad. That is not the case. Those Jewish leaders and those Roman officials, they were just pawns in a major chess game going on between God and his enemy, Satan. They really weren't in charge at all. Things were going to unfold the way God wanted them to. And Jesus' sacrifice on that cross was his very purpose from coming. And all this had to happen so that God could raise him again on that third day to conquer sin and death. Everything Jesus did that week fulfilled God's plan. Okay. So now we're going to move on into chapter 11. Just wanted to set that up. He was going into Jerusalem, and he knew he was going to go there to die. So let's pick up and read along with me in Mark 11. As they, talking about Jesus and his disciples, approached Jerusalem, came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a coat tie, colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people at, standing at there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it, and many people, 
Many people spread their cloaks on the road while other pe others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. It was a beautiful scene, amazing scene, lots of people, lots of excitement, lots of celebration. Now here's a map, I want to show you a map of that area. Bethany is just two miles east of Jerusalem, and that was the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And if you know anything about the chronological part of the gospel here, Jesus had probably just raised Lazarus from the dead. And there was probably a certain buzz going on around in this area, but this guy has raised the dead. And Bethage was about a mile then from Jerusalem, and as they walked from Bethany to Bethage, page, it was about a mile, and there were, they were at the summit of the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is a, has an elevation of about 2,700 feet, and it descended down into the city of Jerusalem. So as you were going down the hill, you could look right into Jerusalem, probably could see right into the temple court. Everything that day, which shouldn't surprise us, everything that day happened just as Jesus said it would. And it also happened the way that Zechariah said it would. He referred, Zechariah referred to the Zion's king, the Messiah, riding into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey. And he wrote this 500 years before this event happened. Here's what Zechariah said in chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years before the event, it unfolded just as Zechariah said it would and just as Jesus said it would. Now, this colt had never been ridden. And for an animal to be used for a sacred purpose, it could not have been used for anything else. And this was truly a sacred moment as prophecy was fulfilled and as Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem. So by now, the news of Jesus coming to Jerusalem had spread to the Jews living in that area, and the, anticipating was built, the anticipation was building. They'd heard Jesus' teaching and how they amazed the crowds, and they would have heard the reports about how this guy walked on water, how he healed the sick, how he cast out the demons, how he calmed the storm, how he fed the multitudes, and how he even raised the dead back to life. There was an excitement building about this guy that was coming in Jerusalem, and, and um, they were excited, and, and they, they could identify him as the Messiah, and they had visions and hopes of the return of the earthly kingdom that was greater than King David's kingdom, which was the greatest pinnacle of the Jewish nation at, up to that point. They welcomed him with shouts of praise and celebration. This was big. But I wonder, what was it like for Jesus as he rode that colt down that hill, listening to the praises of these people, when he knew that in within a week, he would be betrayed by a friend, arrested, abandoned by other friends, mocked, beaten, listened to the chants of people crying, maybe some of these same people crying, crucify him crucify him, and then nailed to a cross to die. We can be thankful that Jesus came with a much bigger picture in mind. Because as we look at the here and now, and what's in it for us, Jesus tends to look at it through the lens of eternity, and what is best for us. You know, that just makes me think. And just a little side note here. When we think about worship and praise, we a lot of times think of singing or music and stuff, but our whole life is to be a worship to God. And I guess I just want to ask us, even when we do any of these stuff that we consider worship, do we focus on eternity? Or do we just tend to get into the here and now? What do I like? What feels good for me? Worship is meant to focus on God, and we just need to be careful not to make it about us. And because we always need to remember 
that it was Jesus' love because of our sins that held Jesus to that cross. The nails did not hold him to the cross. It was his love. Let's go on. Mark 11, verse 11. It says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple courts, and he looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, Jesus probably could see as they were riding down Mount of Olives into Jerusalem what was going on in the temple courts. But as he arrived, he walked right in there and it said he looked around at everything. He wanted to get a real good idea of what was going on. But since it was late, he and his disciples walked that journey back to Bethany. And I've often wondered, what, what does that two mile, which is about, what, 45 minutes, maybe an hour since it's uphill, what would that be like? What was that like to talk about the events of the days? I'm sure the disciples probably focused in on all the celebration, but Jesus was focused on what he saw in that courtyard. And I got a feeling that what he saw caused him great concern, probably even made him angry. Although, you know, it's interesting that none of the gospel writers said that Jesus was angry in this situation. We've assumed that as we read it because of what is going to happen next. But it never says that he was angry. Let's go ahead and read, starting at verse 15. We're going to skip a couple verses, come back to him, but let's look at 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of the sell, those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And he, as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for ways to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. You know, it was Passover time, and the Passover was a major Jewish holiday, if you didn't know that, where Jews from all over the world would come to Jerusalem to pay honor and homage to celebrate their escape from Egypt. And uh, they would pay their annual temple tax and make their sacrifices for Passover. And the outer courts... I got a picture here that you can see kind of the, and the outer courts was the court of the Gentiles. Is it up? No. Nope. You get up. Yeah, here we go. You can kind of see, when you look coming down the hill, this is kind of what you would see. And so you got this court of the Gentiles, and then you got the inner courts. And <clears throat> this was the only place that non-Jewish people could be, and they were for people who were interested in seeking God. And it was supposed to be a place of prayer and preparation to enter the temple for worship. So here's what Jesus should have seen. Jesus should have seen a large, diverse crowd of Jews and Gentiles praying and preparing their hearts to honor God. He should have seen people being respectful to the rituals and worship established by God and people being considerate of each other in that situation and celebrating and helping each other with their needs. But here's what Jesus saw as he come down to the temple and came into the tent, tent, came down the hill and into the temple. This is what he saw. He saw the court of Gentiles full of the sounds and smells of sheep and goats and cattle, doves and pigeons being sold for an extravagant prices. Tables where foreign money was exchanged into Jewish shekels for inflated fees. He saw unethical business transactions being negotiated and carried out. And he saw people taking shortcuts through the temple court without even considering what was going on for other people. Jesus showed an amazing amount of resolve and courage and termination. And here's what he did do. He got everybody's attention. He got everybody's attention when he came in there and and just what, and it's interesting because I got thinking about this. Whatever he did, he didn't go to the point where it caused them to bring in the Jewish temple guard, or even worse, the Roman guards to come in and he didn't, he didn't cause a riot. Whatever he did caught them so off guard that they were stunned 
and it stopped what was going on that day. Jesus stopped what was going on, the wrong that was being done. He exposed the hypocrisy and greed of the Jewish leaders. He made the, this a, an amazing teaching opportunity. It said he taught all day. They were there all day, and he was teaching the people, and it said they were amazed. They were amazed at his teaching of what he was saying. So as he was getting everyone's attention, he was using that as a teaching moment. And then it revealed that God was not just the God for the Jewish people. He was a God for all nations. The people were amazed by his actions and his teaching. The priests were embarrassed, exposed, afraid, angry, and looking for ways to kill Jesus. So let's cons I want you to consider a few truths that I picked out of this scene. There are times when we must stand up for God's truths, but we have to do that with integrity. We have to do that with keeping things under control and letting God be in control. Jesus kept his emotions within the realm of God's will because we know that Jesus do did not sin. He never sinned. He never sinned. He was tempted in every way. I bet he was tempted to go beyond. But he was tempted in every way, but he never sinned. So whatever he did, what well, he did within the control and within the realm of God's will that day. Another takeaway is that worship is about God and not people. These people had made it all about opportunity and themselves. What can I gain out of this experience? He said, no. Worship is about God. He knows. He knows your heart. He knows what we come in here with. He knows where, how you live your life. He's watching at all time. I don't know if we really realize like that. Do we really live like Jesus is watching us at all times? He knows what our worship is really like. And he also says our motives matter. Why we do what we do is just as important sometimes and maybe more important than what we do. That's so important. And how you prepare your heart to worship is really up to you. And God knows. And this is a big one. Your relationship with God is more important than religious traditions. You need to be in a relationship with God not just go through a bunch of rituals and things that make you look like you love God. You need to love God. And to obey is better than sacrifice. There's one last event that I want us to look after that conflict in the courtyard. We talked about the cult, the conflict in the courtyard. Now we're going to talk about a curse. Let's move on. Chapter 11. Before and after this scene in the courtyard... There's an, there's an encounter with a fig tree that sets up a very important teaching moment for Jesus. Let's go back to verse 12 and through 14, then we'll read 20 through 25. Here we go. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find it out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for the figs. And when he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say that. And then they went on to the temple, and the whole spent the whole day at the temple. So it says, then the next day, here we go. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is, has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they will say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. When Jesus approached that fig tree that morning, that first morning, it looked very healthy and very promising. But as he got closer and he looked into it deeper, he didn't find any fruit. The purpose, 
of a fig tree is to produce figs. And if it doesn't accomplish its purpose, then it's just not necessary. Most commentators agree this is one of the hardest passages in the scriptures to figure out what he means. And I'm not here to figure out what all, if there's all these hidden meanings. But the bottom line here is that Jesus' words to that fig tree were powerful enough to change the course of that tree's life. Or actually death. And Jesus had already shown that his word had the power over creation when he calmed the storm. Why should it be surprising that this tree responded to his words? This cursed tree set up another teachable moment for Jesus and his followers at the beginning of what was going to be a very difficult week. So when you are confused and disappointed, let's say in the fig tree, Jesus encouraged his friends with what I think is the key verse in this whole chapter. It says, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Faith is so important. And believe it. And really, interestingly enough, everybody lives by faith in something or someone. But faith is when you believe something to the point that you trust that so that you will obey that. It's not just believing. It's much more. It's actually acting on that belief and living that out. I mean, if you put, I don't know what you put your faith in, hopefully, I mean, I'd love to think that everybody here and all of us, we put our faith in God. But sometimes we put our faith in ourselves or we put our faith in other people or we put our faith in our jobs or, or our money or, or some philosophy or just anything we can put our faith in. And I tell you, in the times of crisis, what you put your faith in is expo- is, will be displayed. Jesus takes the time here to connect faith and prayer in this teaching. Faith is connecting to God. Prayer is communicating with God. And when we are connected to God and communicating with God, we can have the confidence in the connection that we've made. We need to live with confidence. In those days, it was a common practice for the rabbis to say and to refer to the difficulties of life as a mountain. So whether this was figuratively figuratively or literal, the idea was, Jesus, God can move the mountains of your life. And Jesus wanted his followers to know the importance. Jesus is teaching his followers here that we need to be willing to take our mountains or difficulties to God in prayer. We need to be confident that God hears and will answer. We need to be still and listen to God's guidance from his word and his spirit And we need to have the courage and discernment to accept God's guidance. And we need to be right with God, and we need to be right with others. Bitterness blocks prayers. Those relationships between other people that aren't going so well can block your prayers. We need to be right with God and with others. William Barclay says this, For many people, prayer is either a pious ritual or a forlorn hope. It should be a burning expectation. Prayer is a power which can solve any problem and make us able to deal with any difficulty. Billy Graham said this, We are to pray in times of adversity lest we become faithless and unbelieving. We are to pray in times of prosperity lest we become boastful and proud. We are to pray in the times of danger lest we become fearful and doubting. We are to pray in times of security, lest we become self-sufficient. Prayer is much more than a wish. It's the voice of faith directed to God. So Jesus entered Jerusalem with faith in God's plan and confidence in his purpose. And he faced that week with courage, humility, resolve, determination, and most importantly, prayer. And Jesus believed that we were worth it, all that he was going to encounter. When we put our faith in Jesus, we can have that same confidence and courage that Jesus had as his Father in heaven as we face the ups and downs of life. You know, I've heard a number of folks, including my dad, when he was uh, going through his battle with cancer, he said, I do not know what people do who do not have faith in God when times of crisis come. So my faith is the only thing that helps me in these times. 
Last week, I was talking to a lady I met in the hospital, an older lady, and we were talking about this idea of the importance of our faith. And she told me that when she was a little girl, about 10 or 12, she had all these questions about God, and she went to her grandma, which grandmas are the good people to go to if you need to talk to someone. She went to her grandma because she had all these questions. How can I believe in a God that I can't see? And her grandma pointed to the tree and said, do you see that tree? And she said, yes, I see that tree. And she said, do you see the wind blowing the leaves in that tree? Yes, I see the wind blowing the leaves in that tree. She said, God is like the wind. You don't always get to see him, but you do get to feel him, and you know he's at work. And she said that thought has stuck with her her whole life. So while she was laying there in that hospital bed, her faith in God, that was instilled to her by her grandma many years before was what was getting her through. We need to have faith in God in the good times and when the crowds are cheering. We need to have faith in God when we stand up for God's truth because he will be with you. We need to have faith in God when we are disappointed because God will provide. And we need to pray with confidence because God is listening. We're gonna enter a time of communion, a moment for you to spend some time in prayer, reflecting on your relationship. And to do that, I wanted us to read a statement of faith together. This was written by someone who lived 3,000 years ago. It's one of the most common passages in the Bible, but it is his, it is King David's, maybe when he was a shepherd boy, it's his statement of faith. And as we read this, I want you to think about this as a statement of faith. Can you really say these words? So as we prepare our hearts for communion, read this with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father God, I thank you for the confidence that we can have to approach you. Help us to have the courage to bring to you the mountains in our lives. Lord, as we spend a few moments here thinking about our relationship with you through Jesus, as we reflect on his death, his body and his blood, I just pray that you'll speak to us and encourage us Help us to understand just how much we are really loved and that how we can know that we are in a right relationship with you through these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.
Are in love. 